Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we are starting the session. Thank you very much for everyone who is here. Uh, the name of our session or the topic is uh, Overcoming Barriers to Bridge uh, Digital Divide. I think this is a 30-year-old topic, uh, which, uh, which is quite challenging because we are still tackling with this one. Uh, and uh, uh, when internet had come to our life, the divide had started since then, and we are still. I was I was looking at one of the statistics that ITU had posted, saying that uh, 2.6 billion people still do not have access uh, out of the 7. Point some billion, uh, which is like one third of the world is still not have uh, connectivity. And when this proposition of this session was done, it was not only meant for that digital divide is only limited for those people who do not have access. But we also wanted to discuss about how do we redefine or how do we define digital divide? Uh, what is digital divide? Because it is not that those people who do not have access are divided, but those people who are having access sometimes cannot afford it. And sometimes it's not meaningful. Sometimes they cannot do transactions. Sometimes they do not have literacy to use it. Uh, so uh, if we claim that we have more than uh, you know, 5 billion people connected, I am sure almost half of them will not have meaningful connectivity. They may, have, they may be part of the data who may have used internet once in a while. And then there is a third category, which is the most important category, is that because of the digital divide, are you excluded? And it's not only that not included, but excluded, because there are legislation which says, there are rules which says that you can only do transaction online. Then there are rules that says that you can only make your payment online. Then there are rules that says that you can only uh, have uh, you know, entitlement when you have a digital identity. So we, uh, in the last 30 years, I think we have also progressed in such a way that legislation, rules, regulations have become almost like mandatory where digital is given. And that is a big challenge uh, that we are facing. So therefore, the topic of digital divide is multifaceted. Digital divide does not only not include, but it also exclude. It leave people alone, it leave people uh, inaccessible, it leaves people uh, deprived, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, just to uh, go on, we have uh, this uh, NRI session uh, has six speakers, right, uh, in the first uh, part of the session. And uh, uh, just to be, you know, uh, comfortable that everybody shares their part of uh, intervention, uh, I would request if you can uh, share all the speakers that if you can share your intervention in the first part, three to four minutes or maximum five minutes, that will be really uh, nice. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we have been uh, all the speakers from different parts. We have Africa part also to hear the story, what is happening there. We have Asia, we have uh, Europe, we have Latin America, and we have Arab also, MENA region. And uh, uh, although our list says that I should have gone first to Ponsulate, who was representing Africa, but he is not here, he will come. Uh, we will go first to Asia. And uh, may I request uh, Mr. Pek Si Zhu, uh, from China IGF to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Osama, right? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Pei Xu. I'm a professor of the Communication University of China. And I think at the beginning, I would like to introduce to you two types of uh, digital device that I'm very much interested in. One is domestic in China, that is called uh, the de divide in terms of age. The other is a kind of transnational divide, which is uh, very important uh, uh, globally. Uh, so among all these different kinds of uh, divides, uh, gender divide, right, a connection divide, or quality of use divide, or a kind of urban-rural divide, 
among all these divides, perhaps in China, the most obvious one is uh, this divide in terms of age. We do not have a, a kind of a gender divide, fortunately, uh, which means 50% uh, of internet users, 51% of internet users are men, and 49% uh, of users are women, so that doesn't make a difference. Uh, the most prominent divide is this divide in terms of age. And that uh, we have, uh, for example, 13% uh, of the of the internet users are old people, and they don't have a, a voice somehow online, which led to potentially a phenomenon that I call it uh, old, bad old people phenomenon. So the old people online are considered to be, are described to be rather bad. Uh, if they, for example, fall down on the street, you should never go and help them because they are going to somehow charge you that you are responsible for this kind of uh, uh, stuff. So there is a kind of bad old people phenomenon. The fact is that the old people are very devoted actually. They, they, they do a lot of things. They help the young, uh, their young, their sons and the doctors to take care of the babies and the kids and so forth. But they are, they don't have a good image online. And uh, that is also a phenomenon that is called bad mother-in-law online. So the mother-in-laws are considered to be bad online because they don't have a voice, only young women are online. So that is one thing in China that is a dominant one. And uh, globally, I think that is also a transnational divide, which is again, uh, very important. And uh, uh, so this, this divide, I think is important to improve some global understanding. Uh, for example, I have uh, this uh, kind of uh, poll, uh, sometimes also in the classroom, the, kind of a classic uh, poll or research asking uh, what does it remind you when talking about a region, when talking about China, when talking about uh, Africa, when talking about the United States. And there is one answer particularly from one student from my classroom is that when talking about Africa, it reminds of her of a lot of animals. And what was the reason? The reason is that she watched too many BBC documentaries about the animals in Africa. However, she does not pay a lot of attention to the people, to the life, to the prosperity over there. So that is somehow also created, some biases, discriminations are created out of this kind of divide. And the most important of all, I think, is this country a good country? Or is this country free? Or is that country not free? Is this country dem democratic? Or is that country not democratic? And that is somehow also we can find the reasons from this transnational divide. So in that case, I think it is very important uh, to, to tackle this. And uh, you have mentioned that uh, we have been talking about this topic for like 30 years, uh, many years, uh, but the, the kind of symptoms are now surfacing, are appearing and are showcasing. I think uh, uh, measures are needed. Maybe we can come back to it uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it was very interesting to note that you have no gender divide because most of the other Asian countries is a serious gender digital divide and, and, and so much so that the percentage is very, very low. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can go to Europe and uh, uh, would like to hear uh, Ms. Claire Popini. Is that the right pronunciation? Popino. Popino, yeah. yeah, from the French IGF. Uh, your turn, please. Thank you. Uh, bonjour à, à toutes et tous. Uh, I am Claire uh, Popino, Senior Director at Mini French Ministry of Justice and um, uh, in charge of the INSER project. Uh, I have a title for my intervention, Digital Inclusion Behind the Walls. Because in France, by principle and for obvious security reasons, French prisons are part of the unconnected places. Uh, thus, detainees do not have access, with some exceptions, to digital technology and internet. However, one of the missions of the prison administration, as defined by the prison law of 2009, consists of reintegration. And the internet and digital technology are very important factors in this reintegration, and for several reasons. 
First of all, the increase in e-administration um, requires that uh, detainees be able to have technical access to this set of administrative interfaces, social security, insurance, etc. Um, likewise, for any daily procedure which will allow a detained person once released to return to a normal life context, online procedure to find housing, to find a job. And allowing access to is often hardly enough. Uh, I will review this point a bit later. Secondly, why connecting detainees is, a necessar is necessary in order to reintegrate? Um, in France, digital professions are in tension. It lacks of people. Uh, just, uh, I will give you some numbers. In 2022, 945,000 jobs in the digital sector were available, but 85,000 uh, um, were not filled. It is 10% uh, of them. Uh, in 2022, to 70% um, of digital companies in the Hauts-de-France, a French region, uh, cannot find recruits. And by 2030 projection, the number of digital jobs is expected to increase by 100,000 per year. So a balance of interests need to be done between the question of security in prisons and the question of reintegration. Um, it has security in the longer term, uh, with the strong opportunity that, is, that lies in digital uh, skills. Furthermore, any detainee who receives training during their detention sees the rate of recidivism drop very significantly. So we, can, we cannot let uh, outside internet world uh, this, those uh, detainees. But on the point I left for a minute, there, there are obstacles in prison. Uh, first of one, technological issues to guarantee security in the connectivity. Only few actions uh, actually exist toward detainees regarding digital and the internet worlds. And um, there are several issues which meet the social issues surrounding what in France is called electronisme, um, issues surrounding uh, illiteracy, issues surrounding the ability to learn, and the question of self-censorship self and how to make training courses that seem technical and cute at edge, yet accessible and attractive. Um, that is where the INSER project intervenes. INSER for, in French, inséré par des structures expérimentales de responsabilisation et de réinsertion par l'emploi. It means <laughs> innovate through experimental structures of empowerment and reintegration through employment. Um, the, just a few words about this project and the aspects already publicly known. Uh, there are small structures which will accommodate voluntary convicted persons uh, in which 100% uh, uh, of the detained person will work or be in professional training. Uh, these structures will aim to offer value-added work, allowing uh, uh, them to improve their skills. Uh, so work will therefore be uh, strongly coupled with professional training and even schooling. And digital professions should hold an important place. Um, thus, the answer establishments are being designed um, as connected by design uh, with the deployment of a specific network for all access of detainee persons uh, in the personal dimension, for example, video with family, or in the learning and professional dimension. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for broadly elucidating the France scenario. I hope that also is, is, was the broader scenario of the entire Europe. Uh, now let's go to Latin America, and uh, I would request Carla Velasco uh, to uh, elaborate the situation in that side. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation here, Osama, and the rest of the panel. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I have been working uh, with access projects as part of civil society now and also um, 
uh, with the government in Mexico for seven years now, and um, the things are, haven't changed that much, right? Uh, the situation on digital inclusion is, is a very important one in Mexico and in the rest of, of the region, uh, in the Americas region. And the main problem still remains to connect the people that are unconnected. Um, we've been working together with regulators and with the governmental offices, not only from Mexico, but from different um, Latin American countries. And we see that the, uh, the digital divide does not reflect sometimes the other type of digital divides that are accessibility, availability, affordability, quality, quality of services, and digital skills. So these are other, other uh, divides that need to be tackled. And also the differences that uh, exist between rural and um, urban areas. So one of the main issues is that in urban areas you get to have a good connection, people are connected, um, it is somehow affordable for the people to connect, but then uh, in urban and remote, in rural and remote areas, the situation is complicated, and the situation gets even more complex when you have uh, different marginalized groups that are um, living in these rural and, and remote areas, like is the case of indigenous peoples in some cases, and in the case of Mexico, for example, right? Um, so this is a very, very important issue. In Mexico, it has been also raised the issue of um, connecting women and girls because they are also affected by the digital divide and there's also a gender digital divide. And um, one of the things that we have been working together with the government in order to bring um, um, better connectivity and even connectivity to some of the rural and remote areas is the work through uh, community networks. So in Latin America, um, the community networks movement is a very strong movement. Uh, we, we have been working together with different governments uh, in the region, regulators as well, and together with the um, um, with CITEL, which is the Inter-American Commission of Telecommunications of the Organization of the American States. And through this commission, we have been pushing very hard to, to put um, access as a main priority. And this was reflected as well in the World Telecommunications Development Conference last year of the ITU. Uh, whereas the region, we worked together uh, to bring this topic as, an, as a priority, not only for the Americas region, but also the rest of, of the regions at, at this world conference. And we managed to get um, to mention the importance of, of this problem in some of the resolutions, and also to include the importance of, of community networks. So for ones that might, might do not know, community networks are community-based initiatives. Um, led by the communities in uh, some of the cases, these are a solution and not a, um, a, a replacement of internet service providers, but rather um, innovative solution in order to build um, common infrastructure and for the people of the communities to be in charge of, of the network. Uh, this means that there are different training programs that are given um, and uh, that are done together with the communities for there to be community technicians and also not only to talk about the technical part but also the sustainability part, how uh, the network is going, how the community is going to be involved in, in the network and this sometimes trans transitions to the creation of uh, local content in the communities with the language of the same communities. So um, these uh, uh, community networks have become a very, very important agent. Community networks are also now working with internet service providers, uh, with companies, uh, uh, community networks are trying to get access to backbone, which is also very important to make network stronger and to have, to yes, to make the networks stronger and to have a, a better connectivity, uh, to have more 
megabytes in, in the network and to be able to, to have a, a better quality for the network. And in Mexico, another case that has been very interesting is the um, creation of an indigenous uh, mir uh, virtual uh, mobile operator, uh, which is an MVNO, Mobile Virtual Network Operator. Uh, and in this case, the owners of the mobile virtual network uh, are indigenous communities. So this has also been a very innovative solution as a way of looking forward and connecting the unconnecting. So yes, just to summarize, one of the, uh, this remains one of the biggest problems for the Latin America region. We are trying to find uh, different solutions and as part of a civil society member uh, in Latin America, these are some of the solutions that we are working with, which are the community networks. But uh, companies and governments are also included and we are all worried about closing the digital divide. So thank you, Osama. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think just to break the monotony, we also go from on-site to off-site and go a little online and uh, catch uh, Bhanu Nupain from UNESCO uh, to request his intervention. Bhanu, are you online? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you so Wonderful. much. With your permission, um, it's quite interesting uh, some of the intervention which uh, have been made. Uh, uh, that provides a, a very interesting in a perspective that there is a, a, a major, uh, say, segment of the population are still not connected. Uh, I've just you know looking at you know ITU website and uh, they actually say that you know only 5.7% 7 billion people are online you know right now so this means you know it's uh, shared by uh, by by the rule of exclusion uh, there are 2.7 billion people who are still not on internet so this is this is i think a grave concern for all of us and given the fact that you know many of these um, uh, the the services that government provides have gone online so uh, we have been working uh, since 2003 when UNESCO's uh, member state adopted a, a, a recommendation on, uh, on, on, on uh, you know, content uh, in, the, in the cyberspace. Uh, so in fact, the multilingual content on the cyberspace. So I think you know, what uh, I, my pitch you know, here will be, will be to talk and, and give you a, a slight, you know, uh, like roundabout of you know what we are doing as far as uh, universal acceptance is is concerned. So um, the fundamental principle of digital inclusion is to provide all individuals, regardless of their background, wealth, language, and abilities, an equal opportunity to participate in digital processes. Nevertheless, there are formidable obstacles that impede this objective. And uh, I can and UNESCO are talking about universal acceptance, which promotes inclusive design and the dissemination of accessible digital content. It serves as catalyst for development of digital services and platform that uh, appeals to an inclusively diverse audience, including people with disabilities. This transformation results in a digital environment that is accessible and accommodating to people with diverse requirements. Here I wish to note that universal acceptance needs to be in interpreted in its widest uh, connotation and must include the whole ecosystem of digital tools, processes, and contents. Because sometimes, you know, what we do is we narrowly define and only talk about content uh, that is available. Um, and then somehow we tend to forget that the processes and tools are also equally important when we start, you know, talking about, you know, uh, universal acceptance or universal inclusion. Uh, here, I would like to use the word universal inclusion, which was the recommendation that was uh, made by uh, this year's, you know, Eurodig meeting, which uh, starts talking about uh, validation of uh, uh, the representation of multil multilingual and locally relevant content. By stimulating the uses of an array of language script and character sets, it facilitates the accessibility of digital resources to individuals with different abilities and those coming from different linguistic backgrounds. Uh, quite interestingly, only 14 languages represents almost you know, 92% of the content that is available online. So that, uh, and uh, this is a, a very interesting reality that there are 
almost you know, 7,000 languages which are still spoken by different people. So this expansion effectively broadens the scope of digital content and increases its uh, relevance to a wider audience. So I think you know, we have to do a lot of uh, effort uh, to somehow you know, make uh, the, the, uh, the, the internet experience as well as internet um, say interface uh, go um, in in multilingual way you know if we start you know talking about uh, digital uh, inclusion so moreover this universal acceptance and acceptance you know which we normally uh, advocate facilitates an enhanced user experience as well it mandates the uniform functionality of digital services across a wide range of devices and technological platforms including antiquated and more uh, cost-effective hardware, which I think, you know, like uh, another 2 billion people in the world, you know, essentially possess. Uh, this effort eliminates the need for most recent and frequently more expensive technology, thereby creating a digital ecosystem that is accessible and affordable to all. Here, universal acceptance uh, transcends the technological domain. It also promotes global cooperation and adherence of uh, international standard. For UNESCO, we understand that universal acceptance is part of the 2003 recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism in, uh, and universal access to cyberspace. This issue has also been advocated by WISIS process. Uh, Action Line 3 normally talks about uh, access to information. So these are landmark provisions you know, which provide a framework for member states to uh, develop and adapt legislation and other policy measures conducing to the promotion of multilingualism in cyberspace. Um, thereby, you know, bringing this, you know, one billion people which are uh, yet to be shared, you know, with internet. This advocacy promotes a coercive uh, framework for digital services, thereby reducing fragmentation and boost um, interoperability, you know, which is uh, a major concern for all of us. The outcome is uh, a streamlined process for the creation of economically viable and accessible digital technologies and content. But here I would like to stress the need for a multi-stakeholder multi partnership, uh, which are uh, needed to foster universal acceptance. It needs cooperation between governments, private sector um, uh, entities, especially digital service providers and civil so so society uh, organizers. Do it. So some, some of these you know, stakeholders have already spoken you know, during uh, uh, the, the, this, this, uh, this town hall meeting. These partnerships have potential to produce policies and initiatives that promote uh, affordable access and ensure digital content appeal that appeals to a larger audience. Finally, and this will be the last point you know, that I like to make, is uh, universal acceptance is a driving force behind digital inclusion in advocacy. Uh, we recently undertook and member state, you know, every four years, you know, they report back on 2003 recommendation and only 32 countries rep uh, 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 reported uh, on what they are doing in their country. So that means, you know, almost uh, 160 countries did not. So um, there is a lot to be done we talk about universal acceptance and universal inclusion in, in across the board, but it looks like you know these are not properly integrated in the policy uh, milieu that we um, essentially are argue for a universal inclusion or in digital divide in our countries. So we have to do a lot on this one. And I think uh, this is a very complex uh, undertaking and, and, uh, and requires a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, partnership, you know, as I already said. From Thank UNESCO you. side, we assure our full participation in the processes to create a digital ecosystem for all individuals, regardless of their diverse linguistic background and uh, abilities. So Thank, Thank you, you. Chair. And if there are questions, I'll be more than happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for highlighting the, uh, you know, universe and inclusion. I hope we do, do not take another three decades to connect the rest of the 2.5 billion and extended STG kind of phenomena. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we come to Zina, uh, Zina uh, uh, Boharb uh, from Lebanon. And uh, let's hear from you in the Arab scenario or the MENA scenario. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zina Boharb. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the uh, Lebanese IGF. 
And uh, at the same time, I work at Ogero Telecom, which is the incumbent operator in Lebanon as head of international uh, cooperation. Uh, in our digital world, uh, inclusion means leaving no one offline. And a uh, barrier to this inclusion can start with the, the lack of ICT infrastructure, but, but also there are a lot of other barriers, like the lack of skills, uh, like the cost of the, of the services, and even uh, in different countries, in, there are different c scenarios for, uh, for this uh, uh, digital uh, divide. Uh, in Lebanon, the currently, the, the latest, lately adopted uh, digital transformation uh, strategy aimed uh, to closing the digital uh, divide uh, in general. Uh, I mean, in general uh, means starting with uh, increasing the, uh, the physical access through the ICT infrastructure. Um, and uh, the result was that currently 84% of the Lebanese population have access to, to, to the internet. Uh, in the Arab uh, region, uh, the internet penetration rate for women was 56% and 68% of men in 2020, which is uh, a good number compared to, to the uh, global uh, average then in, uh, in, in that year, which was uh, 55%. Especially that there are a lot of uh, Arab countries that are uh, uh, classified as the least developed uh, with, with penetration rate of 19% uh, only. And this was taken into consideration while drafting the, uh, the, Arab, uh, digital, uh, the Arab digital agenda. Uh, which uh, that set as one of its uh, objectives to increase the rate uh, of internet penetration among women in all Arab countries, as well as to increase internet penetration rate among users in rural areas and to enhance digital accessibility for persons with disabilities to enable them to access electronic services. And uh, this year in uh, January, uh, this uh, uh, agenda that we call Arab Digital Agenda was adopted by the Council of Arab Minister of Telecommunication and uh, Information Technology. Uh, it will be, it, it's a framework uh, for the years 2023-2033 to ensure that all Arab countries can benefit from digital technology and use, uh, and use it to achieve su sustainable uh, development. Uh, among the, the list of action uh, within this uh, strategy uh, was the uh, preparing capacity building uh, programs for women on internet use with a focus on uh, women in rural uh, areas. And also preparing uh, awareness and training programs on digital accessibility uh, with uh, developing national policies for uh, digital access and establishing national uh, committees to prepare programs and initiatives that enable the protection of, of young people uh, on the internet, along with preparing integrated programs to educate and empower them. Uh, on another uh, side, we know that uh, ITU has a, a history in bridging the uh, gender digital, uh, the gender digital uh, divide. And one of the latest uh, milestones in that regard was the establishment of the network uh, of, uh, of the network of women. Um, so, uh, with with different chapter, regional chapter in our uh, Arab region, the the national the regional network uh, of women for the Arab region was established in uh, 2021. This platform uh, was uh, aimed to, to promote the effective participation of Arab women in the activities of, uh, of the union in general and give visibility to, to women and empower them to assume greater responsibilities within the delegation in different uh, conferences. So um, 
it encourages women just to, to guide other, their other colleagues and to empower them and uh, to create a stronger base for women uh, in the, in the, from the Arab region and the digital space. Returning to Lebanon, at Ogero, we, we also uh, know that, believe and know that the bridging the digital uh, gender divide requires digital skills, along with other uh, skills. Uh, that's why we partnered with uh, the Arab Network of Women lately to hold a series of capacity building workshops organized uh, by Ogero, in which uh, uh, Lebanese uh, women can participate on site at uh, the premises of Ogero and other Arab women uh, join uh, remotely. And the first uh, workshop was held on October uh, 4, 5, uh, just a few, few days ago, and it was a huge uh, uh, success. We have a, a list of uh, topics that are uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, series of workshops, uh, let's say. Uh, but we, we hope that after, our, after the success of our first uh, workshop, other uh, uh, women will be more encouraged to join. Um, this is... Thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you for highlighting uh, just not uh, Lebanon, but the entire Arab area. That gives a very uh, good picture of the entire uh, region. Uh, is Ponsulate here? Uh, can, you, uh, can you also take your uh, uh, name? And, uh, you know, since Ponsulate is not here, you can take your name. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Naza Nicholas Krama, and um, I come from, I am currently the uh, coordinator for um, Tanzania IGF. And uh, essentially, I would like to take off from where the Banu, Mr. Banu left from uh, UNESCO. Uh, really, um, the, the, the language divide, uh, or if I may say, um, I would like to uh, divide um, uh, what you have as, uh, as, as, as digital divide into six sets of, uh, of, of divides. Number one uh, is infrastructure or connectivity divide. Um, you will find in most rural and urban Africa, the connectivity uh, is really uh, the issue still. And this is very you know, rampant in the, <clears throat> in the rural area as compared to the urban areas. Um, in urban areas, you'll find there is uh, not only a connecti connectivity divide, but also the um, uh, quality divide. Um, uh, you connect to the internet, but the, the services that you are getting from the uh, telecom operators um, uh, is not up to par. So uh, there is that issue of, um, of quality divide uh, as well. Number two, um, we have uh, the language divide. Uh, for example, uh, in Tanzania, where I come from, we have more than uh, 120 tribes. But uh, as you know, 75% uh, of all content uh, uh, on the internet is, is, is on English. Um, uh, and 5.3% uh, is in Russia, Russia. Uh, Spanish uh, is 4.3%, and French is 3.4%. Uh, Even the language that, um, uh, which is widely spoken in East Africa uh, and, and Central, including the uh, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, um, does not feature anywhere. It's, uh, it, do it doesn't have any percentage uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, the content that is online. So you will find that uh, you know, universal acceptance today is as important as you know, connectivity itself. Because if you are connecting people in the rural areas, and most of them, you know, speak, for example, either uh, Kiswahili or some other language, uh, like uh, I come from Kilimanjaro where we speak Chaga, and mostly people, you know, speak Chaga. And that applies to, for example, in Kenya where people speak uh, Kikuyu and, and all these other languages. So even if you connect them 
uh, you provide connect, uh, connectivity to the village, uh, there is still an issue, a big issue of um, uh, language uh, uh, divide. So um, that is also a, an issue as well. Uh, number three, we have the issue of uh, accessibility, uh, digital accessibility divide. Um, you will find, you know, uh, apart from um, uh, the, uh, the connectivity, um, most of these technologies that uh, we use uh, either locally um, also um, they, uh, they are not inclusive enough to include people with disability because uh, according to the statistics that are available, 1.3 uh, billion uh, people uh, of, the, of the 8 billion people around the world uh, people with uh, disability. So you will sign, we'll find that even in Africa, the portion of 1.3 billion uh, also resides in Africa. So there is also the, uh, that issue of um, accessibility divide uh, where technologies uh, actually tend to discriminate uh, people with uh, dis disability. Um, number four, we have uh, digital skills divide. Digital literacy, uh, if I were to give an example uh, in, uh, in Tanzania, we don't even have a number. Our population is about 62 million people. But there are no statistics to show uh, how many, uh, how much, uh, how, what percent of the population uh, is uh, digitally, you know, literate. So uh, that is an issue that uh, as a multi-stakeholder, we really have to come in and, and address those, uh, 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 those challenges. Uh, number five, uh, the gender digital divide uh, according to GSMA. Um, the, in sub-Saharan Africa and in Africa in general, the uh, percentage of gender uh, digital divide stands at um, between 12 and uh, 13 percent. So um, we have uh, more, you know, males online as compared to, to females who are accessing uh, the internet. Uh, number seven uh, is the issue, number six, sorry, is the issue of quality uh, divide. Like I said uh, at the beginning, um, you will find uh, there are great efforts, you know, to connect people, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the urban area. But the quality of the services that people are getting, uh, uh, I see the, the, the last one is really the policy divide where policies are not uniform. Uh, in each country, you'll find uh, the, there are no policies to, um, to, to enable like small-time operators like community uh, services, uh, community uh, networks are, uh, provided uh, to have uh, spectrum allocation that is affordable so they can, they can offer uh, internet connectivity. Uh, with that, I think uh, that would be my first intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was that was wonderful intervention uh, uh, from uh, Africa. I will just take one and a half minute to to highlight some of the Asian part. Uh, also, considering that uh, I personally come from one of the highest populated country in the world uh, uh, out of one point uh, 2.6 billion people who are not connected. Uh, almost close to one belong to India. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and to be very uh, precise, um, India's internet penetration is 48%. Um, and that's not meaningful. If, uh, if we exclude, like you were saying, that most of the people, the quality issue, the meaningfulness uh, issue, and I was just uh, jotting down the countries from Asia, uh, Bangladesh has got 39% penetration. Uh, uh, Pakistan has 54, Sri Lanka has 66%, Nepal has 39%, India has 48.7%. China is the highest with 76.4% uh, internet penetration. And considering that you have more women connected, it's a great news that all, I mean, the 50-50 is there already, more than 50% is already there, but India is not in that situation. And then there is a, uh, I, I would like to also reiterate that if you are not connected, that is clearly that you 
you are not connected, so you are excluded. And then those who are connected but unable to do anything. And one, one indication that I can share with all of you, uh, especially because India is talking about uh, exporting many of its technology uh, at a policy level, like payment system have done India very well, like UPI, yeah, universal payment, uh, I think integration or something like that. And uh, according to the calculation, uh, about 336 million people used in India UPI to make the payment, uh, the payment system, which basically work also orally. I mean, you QR code, you just take the code and you can make the payment. Out of 336 million people who made online payment, uh, only 122 belong to rural India. And rural India's population is 908 million. So out of 908 million people, only 106 million people were able to make online payment. If I consider online payment as a benchmark of quality connectivity or let's say meaningful connectivity because you cannot do con uh, payment without having quality connectivity. So uh, the, these, these are very important thing that are we connecting people just like that or is it something like giving electricity without power, you know, uh, line without power? Are, are we connecting without uh, buffering or we are connecting only with buffering all the time? And your data is coming and going, but you are not really meaningful. So those are some of the issues I just wanted to highlight. Uh, we have another um, about 20, 25 minutes since we started five minutes late, uh, is to uh, go on uh, inviting people around the table and online uh, to get questions. Uh, just being uh, a better host, we would like to go online first since they are not here. So there is at least one or two will take online and then we'll take offline. I count about three hands here, here already and uh, we would like to come back to you for sure. We have enough time to come back to all of you. Julian, can you bring... Uh, we have a request from the Bangladesh uh, Remote Hub. They want to... Uh, uh, place a, a question to to the panelists uh, online. So, if we can please give the floor to them and go on, please. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Moderator and Speaker. I'm Shamima Akhtar. Uh, I'm from I'm Shamima Akhtar. I'm from uh, Bangladesh uh, Chairperson, Bangladesh Women IGF. Uh, thanks very thank you very much for uh, giving opportunity to me for uh, the question uh, platform. So my uh, question is the digital divide. My question to the my, co my question to the uh, honorable moderator, my question to the is uh, the digital divide in our society is leaving low income families behind, especially women. Uh, Thank you, v, uh, is, uh, is that all? Do you want to make? S yes, it, it's leaving, leaving low income families behind, especially women, youths and students have less access to the information they need, but they need ample access to necessary digital technology. How we can ensure the reduction of the digital divide and digital access for all for an inclusive society? Because in most developing countries in educated infra educate infrastructure and technologies resources for the low penetration of the internet in rural areas are two major factors that need to be taken into consideration for the inclusion of all people to reduce the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. Shamima. Uh, and thank you for, uh, you know, initiating the Women IGF in Bangladesh. That's, that's a great initiative. And thank you also for bringing women in your room. Uh, to, to, to show the solidarity that they want to be online and they are online. 
thank you very much. I am sure in the next half an hour in the discussion you will get your answer, but if you are not, then I will personally tackle the question. question. Uh, can I go around the... Uh, thank you very much for hearing to me. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, can I go around the room uh, to... Uh, the, yes, please. Please introduce yourself and ask the question. Thank you. My name is Claire Mohindo. I come from Uganda. Just wanted to supplement on the issue of the language divide uh, when it comes to African countries. I'm currently working on a project to ensure equitable information access for refugee communities in Uganda. And our biggest challenge when it comes to content moderation has been um, language. So we use digital platforms and the languages spoken by refugee communities in our country are diverse. And out of the 10 languages we use on the platforms, only four are supported by the digital platforms. So that means that when we have to develop content in the rest of the six languages spoken by refugees, that means we have to hire translators to translate this content for us. So how can we work with tech companies to bridge the language divide, uh, especially in African countries? Because um, countries working on the similar project in other countries outside of Africa do not experience that because their languages are supported by the tech companies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Julian, do you suggest that we respond to each question immediately or should we collect the question? Yeah. Any any of the panel would like to address this language thing? You would like to? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Yes, I can take both questions because I think they are somehow related. Um, the the issues that women face when when going online, and I think it's. Um, really worth mentioning it, and also how to work better with platforms because it's something that we are also dealing with. Um, <clears throat> so it is it is important to mention that even though uh, numbers and statistics show that in many places the gender digital divide is getting better, and for example in the Americas region, the, the score that we have for, for gender parity in access is actually quite good. But when you get to see the context and you get deeper in the problem, you see that there are questions that are not being asked. The main problem of how access is being measure, measured is that it doesn't reflect many of the realities that we face as, as women and also people of diverse genders and sexualities. This crosses very important gaps and inequalities that women and gender diverse people face in the social, labor, health, economic, and, and political spheres. So it's something that goes beyond that. And what we have seen is that once you get to analyze access and the participation of, of women in the online life, you see that there are many complexities around, the partici around our participation, and there are acts of online violence that even may force women to retreat from the internet. So there is a, um, there's research that indicates that 28% of women who had suffered ICT-based violence reduced their presence online. So you see this is a big issue because even when women get online, we get, uh, we, we get to face violence that makes us silence us and, and censor us. So this is also a, a very important issue. Um, in that sense, we have been also working with, um, with tech companies and platforms because there's a lot of um, platform accountability there. Um, uh, when, when you get to analyze better um, the access of, of women and girls online, you get to see that there are other complexities, which are, for, ex for example, technology-facilitated gender-based violence, uh, gender disinformation, hate speech, and um, many um, civil society organizations are trying to get closer to governments and also work together with uh, big tech companies 
in order to see what we can do better. So the first thing that we, we have realized is that we need more um, research on national contexts. So each country is, is different and the way um, these things happen um, have uh, a specific context. And I'm also relating it to it because it also has to do with language. You know, many women that want to report online don't speak English. So they also face this language barrier. So that's why I'm relating it to the second question. And uh, what we've seen is that in some countries, for example, in Mexico, yesterday I was in a session with a Mexican senator, and she told me how difficult for her as the gender, um, as the gender lead of, of the Mexican uh, Congress, um, it has been very difficult for her to approach big tech companies because normally it is very hard for, for, for them to, to comply. Um, and one of the things that we have seen, um, the, the e-safety commissioner of Australia was in the same panel. <laughs> and what I really enjoyed from the commissioner of Australia's participation is that uh, in Australia the government has forced the companies to comply. So it, it is, as we can see, a, a, a multi-stakeholder thing. Uh, we need the governments, we need uh, the big tech companies to also comply and also to, to make them accountable. And we also need the participation of civil society, uh, academics and researchers, because we also need a lot of information. So I think this would be my answer. Sorry for taking this long. Thank you, Osama. If uh, I may, I may thank you very much. I have one quick line uh, in response to your linguistic diversity mm -hmm. issue and uh, uh, an online content which has come again and again, is that you know a script is no more written now. You know if it is the technology oralization is enabling more and more languages to get online. So we don't have to find a script. Then we find a writing. Then we find it going online. Uh, uh, video-based content generation and oral content generation or oralization of technology is also enabling a lot of inclusion of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call the indigenous languages or the uh, written, because India is also among the same, we have hundreds of languages who are spoken by, div uh, you know, diverse community, and none of those content are available online, but those people are now adopting video as a method to get content online, and, and also oralization of technology and visual. Uh, you want to make a point? Looks like that yeah, you are. Yeah. Maybe uh, a bit disruptive, but <laughs> uh, if, if I may say so, uh, if uh, the IGF, a big event like that, uh, uh, is more multilingual, multilingual, it, it, it will set a, a good example for the rest. Uh, I think it's a symbolic gesture for uh, uh, increase uh, the, the, the case of the multilingual in, multilingualism in internet. But <laughs> maybe a, a bit disruptive, sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to, uh, let's be very precise yes. and short so yes. that we have more uh, questions. I, I wanted to respond to uh, Claire's question on um, the refugees, you know, the language uh, issue. I know uh, in Tanzania, the, uh, Google has been working with, uh, with some uh, individuals to, you know, to translate, you know, Kiswahili um, through, you know, the voices. I think the, what I would suggest is that uh, we, you find individuals, different languages, and then you can also approach Google, and, and they, can, uh, they can do that, uh, that for you as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions from this side. Yeah. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm Ahita Gangavarpu, the coordinator of Youth Internet Governance Forum India. <clears throat> so from my experience <clears throat> back in India, working with young people and also some certain communities, um, I'll go back to the very basics, you know. Communities or even individuals who are using, tend to use cellular networks to stay, uh, talk to their families uh, and just stay connected that way. But when it comes to the internet, um, I have come across individuals and communities who are not interested in having internet in their lives because they find it as a big change in the way that they're living their lives. 
So it could be cultural barriers, just apprehension or low interest. And this is something I've come across personally. So I just wanted to understand how can we change this kind of a perspective? Um, and if you have experienced something similar, and if there are any suggestions on changing this narrative and getting them to look at internet as a resource when um, this kind of a strong perspective is there, that this is not something we immediately require in our lives. Thank you, that's, that's a perspective. Interesting, uh, uh, I would uh, come back with, is there more questions? Yeah. That's it, corner. Uh, I'm Mahi from Sri Lanka. Uh, my perspective is a little bit um, against uh, something that we have discussed uh, almost. Even though we have discussed the same topic for three decades, we, the digital divide is getting bigger and bigger. The digital gap between developed world and developing world is increasing due not only to AI emerging technologies, but also with the digital policies creating regionally and locally without coordination. Example is a GDPR that happened a few years back. The government censorship can also contribute to the digital divide. In many countries around the world, nowadays uh, they are taking uh, cyber security and safer internet as a topic for this divide. So <clears throat> there are a lot of issues that happen regarding media platform monitoring, online activities regarding citizens, and arrest and imprisonments through these uh, legal actions. Uh, I believe as a network of NRIs, which uh, covering around 160 countries and nations, we need to work together. I think this is a good platform to be together to work together towards uh, inclusive internet. Thank you. Thank you. Very good intervention. Thank you for highlighting that even if you are connected, you are internet shutdown or cyber security, national security, there's so many issues that is dividing you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Levi Siansege from Internet Society Zambia chapter and the Youth IGF in Zambia. Um, I, there's one thing I think I've come to be of concern for me. I understand satellite and broadband connectivity as a way to try and bridge the digital divide in a sense. However, it's come to my attention in a way that it's actually a bit more costly for those, especially in rural areas, to access broadband connectivity, which again, has become a way of increasing the digital divide when it's supposed to actually reduce it. Uh, I've noticed in, in my country, for example, we don't have policies that are pushing for low uh, 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 spectrum connectivity like community networks. So my question then comes in uh, to the panel and probably those that have worked on community networks and so on. How then do we engage governments to promote uh, policies that ensure digital inclusion by allowing for small spectrum, but also increasing uh, development of community networks in, for example, my country or those nearby. Because I think community networks in a way promote a lot of digital inclusion. That's my understanding and based on my brief reading, how then do we engage policymakers to ensure that this becomes a reality? Uh, that's my question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Ponsolit, you want to make some point? Or you want to respond to him? Sorry for coming a bit late. I have my asthma disturbed me in the morning. That's why I'm here a little bit late. But I will just directly answer your question. You know, in most cases, um, trying to bridge the digital divide, you have to play it in a multi-sectoral way. The, the telcos have to be involved, and um, there's always a buy-in, usually, when telcos are involved, discussing with governments and discussing with the regulatory authorities to really create a situation whereby, because you talk to an average telco, they will tell you that, okay, you want to put, um, you want us to give, um, take it to the last mile uh, with broadband connectivity, and oh, we we'll say, okay, we have only 15 villages there with less than 500 people living in the community, what do you do? You know. And that is where community networks um, come in. And um, community networks brings in a lot of players, but at the same time, what I've um, um, real, realized also is that 
when you get in even the municipal council involved at local level, you achieve a lot because usually the municipal council will say, okay, you want to set up this community um, network in this area, we are going to um, give the building where it's going to be located and sell, um, sell companies to come to do corporate um, social responsibilities. But the only way to do it, because we still have a number of countries that are um, facing a situation where, whereby the cost of internet, like in the Gambia, is five dollars per um, for one gigabyte of data, you know, which is one of the most expensive in Africa. I think Ghana has about the um, um, lowest, you, you know, on the continent. The average in the continent is about two dollars um, for on, on of the, the um, data. Um, for um, 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 one GB. So how do we bring down this cost? The only way to bring it down this cost, a lot is being done on getting more um, submarine cables around and investing on um, last mile connectivity. And we have to make sure we um, engage the private sector better you know, in this process because they have to also be included, especially the telcos. I mean, 80% of the continent is on voice. So we should know that. So we have done well on voice. Why can't we do it on da data? It's still the same players. Thank you. Thank you, Ponsilet. We have three uh, interventions waiting. Uh, one, Carl, want to say something. And uh, we have two people online who want to say something. And before that, I just want to respond to that Indian intervention, I, Indian Youth IGF, uh, is that uh, by saying that, uh, you know, if many people, even if the internet is available and they don't want to get into and there is an aversion or whatever, they, they don't have motivation. I think it is also because the internet has become socially very noisy in the last 10 years. Uh, and that news is coming all the time. If you remember last 30 years, you'll remember initially everybody wanted to see internet that I want to go there and I find, some, I find something, research something, you know, resource, as a resource. But now most of the people are thinking, okay, internet means Facebook and intra Instagram and uh, Twitter and YouTube and all, only five platforms or six platforms are taking all the attention of all the consumers and that is also reflecting that is it too noisy, insecure, whatever, is also something that is subject of digital divide itself, you know. Why are we uh, looking at uh, uh, like a shopping mall where it's so crowded that I can't do and do shopping my, uh, myself there. So that's one aspect that is there that we need to all collectively work. Uh, coming to community network, uh, for my uh, uh, two cents is that in India, community network has created a legislation change. Now, uh, in India, we have a policy called PM Wani, uh, which is the wide area network or something like that, name after PM, uh, is that anybody can buy internet and sell internet. So whether you use community network as a as a framework, or you uh, or you do point to point, or you do like a community development, or you do as a telco, or a small telco or a local telco, you can do that. There is no licensing fees required. So totally liberalized. You take a backhaul and start distributing. Unless you lie into those forty thousand villages out of five uh, six hundred villages where there is no tel uh, tower at all. Uh, then it's a different matter, then you can build it. So I just wanted to respond and, uh, 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 Carl, can I come to you after uh, I go online so that they are waiting for a long time? Banu, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, uh, for again, you know, giving me an opportunity to speak uh, 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 a, a few things. In fact, you know, very interesting discussion uh, that is going on uh, both online as well as offline. Um, I basically wanted to touch upon a, a, a couple of things. It looks like uh, when uh, different regions you know, presented, uh, they were in fact, you know, uh, they had their own uh, take on, on, on divide, a digital divide. Some of them were talking about you know, access divide, some of them were talking about uses divide, skill divide, content divide, affordability divide, gender divide or generational divide even. And then finally, you know, maybe multilingual divide, you know, which actually uh, took uh, the center stage uh, in, in today's discussion. But it looks like, you know, we still do not have um, 
uh, a set of you know, effective indicators to measure divide across uh, um, uh, the, the world, the globe. We've been talking about divide for a long time, and it looks like you know, this, uh, this, this set of indicator has never been established by um, uh, IGF, ITU, UNESCO, you know, which are a couple of you know, main players. And even, you know, I look at, you know, uh, the, the, the Secretary General's message to uh, uh, the digital, uh, the new, say, uh, digital commons, you know, that he uh, presented. Even in that one, you know, we do not talk about a set of, uh, say, universally agreed, you know, indicated in that amazing divide in their uh, different, you know, say, uh, say, say, forms and shape. So perhaps, you know, what uh, this panel could communicate uh, to uh, the the responsible you know like stakeholders uh, which will um, as, as, as a as a takeaway message from this uh, panel is to come up with uh, a universally agreed indicators to measure a divide that exists uh, in different forms and shape so um, um, I'm not Thank too you, sure yeah. if that is something you know that is already available and that we can take and given the fact that you know the new uh, say um, uh, the the AI revolution and data revolution, you know that has brought in a new dimension to uh, to these divide. So perhaps you know we first you know uh, need to look at uh, how uh, these indicators can be developed and also uh, can be uh, uh, can be uh, main uh, uh, streamlined or mainstreamed, you know, in in different uh, say digital policies across the world. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. I think we need a digital divide index. Uh, 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 I think there is one more comment from online, right, uh, Julian? Yes, it's uh, from the uh, Bangladesh uh, Remote Hub. Uh, they are uh, making uh, a few questions that uh, we can take them so the speakers can refer to them in the next session that we are about to start. So the question is that the digital divide in our society is leaving low-income families behind, especially women, youths, and students have less access to the information they need, but they need ample access to necessary digital technology. So how we can ensure the reduction of the digital divide and digital access for all for an inclusive society? In addition that, in most developing countries, inadequate infrastructure and technological resources for the low penetration of the internet in rural areas are two major factors that need to be taken into consideration for the inclusion of all people to reduce the digital divide. And um, the internet can open up new uh, avenues and opportunities for women, providing them with uh, greater access to education, employment, and entrepreneurship. Technology can also help challenge and break gender stereotypes and uh, biases. How we can ensure digital access for all, especially women? Okay, I think it was the same, uh, almost like the same comment. Do, uh, Carl, you want to go ahead with your pending comment that you wanted to make? Yeah. Just um, uh, regarding the low income, uh, in France during COVID, um, we observed that students uh, were just connected through uh, their smartphone and not uh, uh, through uh, uh, um, computer, etc. So um, it's not just a response for them, but um, um, some um, places uh, called France Connect uh, were implemented. Uh, there, there are places you can find all the equipment uh, you want and uh, also uh, people who can uh, help you uh, with skills uh, to connect uh, to the necessary services you have to, to go. It's just one solution, it's not <laughs> all the solution. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we are in the now last stage, although we have only 10 minutes left, but I think since the lunch is coming, nobody is going to push us out of the room. Uh, we can take uh, uh, at least a couple of minutes. So for all the uh, six speakers, I think the next step is to uh, go ahead and get what is next, what are the things that we can do uh, 
uh, to to uh, as an NRI and and uh, and going forward, maybe actionable items. So I will start uh, from since Ponsolit is already here. I will go to Ponsolit. Uh, can you take one one and a half minute and tell us what are the action points and going forward from here? Moving um, forward, yeah. I think one of the things we have to um, do is um, in bridging this divide is we have to preach about more on digital inclusions really bottom top and engage our municipalities more in the processes you know because in in most cases um, we forget the local players at governmental level in what we do we just want to take actions without contacting those stakeholders that their lives are going to be impacted and i think it's always good to hear from them and it's also very good um, that um, we shouldn't ostracize our telcos who are one of the biggest players in terms of um, making money in the continent. A lot of them have come up with a very loads of innovative solutions on e-commerce and everything and um, even our fintech company um, companies in the continent. So not that things as an African, not that things are not happening, but we have to know that all players to bridge the digital divide, we have to do it rightly and we have to engage local. We start local. And um, the infrastructure is there, but the coordination is not there. And I hope we can do it right. We have seven years to meet the SDGs. We have a lot of things coming up and the best way to do it is engaging properly at local level to hear their problems and providing solutions for them that we bridge the, that inclusion that is greatly needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Pexi. Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, like to say a few words about uh, the possible solutions. I think solution number one is to have options, for example, uh, that to say if you take a taxi and if you use your mobile phone, you should uh, somehow be allowed to pay by cash. Uh, that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also, if you go into the university, you should be allowed to go in with your card and ID instead of using official recognition. So I think I have had some problems with my, my phone about this uh, Apple Pay. So the official recognition has to be activated in order to use it conveniently. So the first thing is to provide options. And secondly, is to create awareness. It is needed to have this, uh, the awareness of this device and also their consequences. So basically, now digital literacy courses have already started in primary school and uh, high school, which are extremely important for the young students to know about the possible stereotypes that can be produced from the device. And number three is about the content policy. A few of our colleagues have touched upon something about the content. I think for so far, I agree very much with my with Sri Lanka uh, colleague by saying that the situation has gone somehow worse uh, from the traditional media to the digital area. Uh, that to say you have never visited a website, for example, under dot, uh, dot what, dot TZ for Tanzania? Have you visited? No, okay. Uh, that is for Tanzania and uh, possibly you have visited a website under dot US, dot DE and even dot IN for India but you have never visited a, a website under .vn, like for Vietnam. Um, so we need to have this kind of awareness and also perhaps we have to implement the content policy to give relevance to UNIGF. I think that is one very significant thing. Uh, that, that to say the global flow of information remains and equal. Uh, so under such circumstances, under the circumstance that the global digital divide cannot be bridged very soon, so we have to ask the platforms to be responsible for the content, for the content, especially about, uh, for example, religious hatred, about, uh, about uh, racial hatred, uh, about ethnic hatred. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, we have uh, the global digital compact here, but unfortunately the content Part, part five was dropped. Part five is about uh, exactly content of uh, misleading 
uh, uh, misleading content and uh, accountability. So it's important to handle this uh, content area by incorporating the terms of service and then by implementing them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Claire. Thank you. Uh, maybe the first step um, is to, to, to address the, issue, the gender is, issue uh, in school. Because, uh, for example, in France, uh, it states it's, it's this kind of stereotype um, um, women are not getting in uh, technological uh, studies. So uh, I think this is a very uh, important divider. Um, this is the first step. And maybe uh, in the um, methodological uh, point of view, um, we can, uh, because I, I, I had worked uh, on the Internet Universality Indicators, maybe uh, one step uh, regarding the, this uh, project uh, of UNESCO is to, um, to w once a uh, lot of countries will have ended the project, to, to look at th these indicators and to um, to make a um, think to think uh, at how we can use it to compare countries because they are not uh, actually they are not used to compare countries but to 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 make a, a, a frame of a country on on the the way internet is uh, is uh, uh, expand in one country but not uh, to to be compared one another so maybe um, at the end of the project uh, we have to reflect on uh, how uh, they can be used uh, for action thank you can we go to carla yes thank you um, in our region, it has come an important, we have an important question that we are asking ourselves because we know that connectivity is coming and eventually many people are going to be online. So what's going to happen when we're all connected? <laughs> and um, the things our colleague from China were saying, was saying are very important in the sense that we, we are not asking the question on why we want to be connected. What do we want to take out from connectivity? And I think this is an important question. Today we have a session at 2.45 that is called What is the nature of the internet? So we're going to address this question. If internet should be a human right, a public good. And in that sense, I really love, um, in, in Latin America, we, we really uh, push the reflection that community networks bring, because community networks, in a sense, ask themselves, OK, it is important to be connected, but, but why is it important for us to be connected? Why do we want connectivity as a community? Why do we want connectivity for the younger people? Why do we want connectivity for the, el for the elders? And in some of the communities, they have realized that they don't even want to be connected, that they want the right of unconnectivity, of not being connected. So I think this is a very important uh, conversation. It's one of the things that um, is, is, is right now happening to us, and it's an ongoing discussion. And I think having uh, the national IGFs, the regional IGFs, these global IGFs is also, they are also very important spaces for us to, to ask this question. So I think this is, a, this is what is next for us. And also working, keep working with the governments, keep working with the uh, with the internet service providers, with the companies, and together as, as civil society. And uh, yes, just also pushing this uh, community network's point of view, because it also includes the different levels and different members of the community. So I think that's what is next for our region. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Uh, dear Zina. Yes, thank you. Um, in, in summary, I think that uh, the internet access uh, is an opportunity and the digital skills are the power. We need the skills with the opportunity to have, to have this, th these powers. So um, my, my opinion is that in partnerships and in a multi-stakeholder approach, everybody should be uh, on this uh, mission to bridge the digital divide, not only the government, not only the private sector or, or the civil society. We all need to collaborate. We, we need to find uh, a link uh, in order to, 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 
to serve the community or in order to make the internet accessible uh, for uh, for uh, everyone it should not be a privilege uh, every every uh, everybody should be able to benefit from internet uh, for a better living so partnerships and uh, multi stakeholder approach i think this is um, a, a a way forward to to deal with the uh, digital divide Thank you very much. I like the uh, word that you use that, you know, access is an opportunity which requires a skill. And all of us has a responsibility to participate to make that happen uh, for those who are not. Uh, can we go for a quick way ahead uh, to uh, Mr. Bhanu? Uh, and then we will close. Uh Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just, uh, uh, it's, it's, it has been a very engaging you know, discussion and uh, uh, I, I learned a lot you know, from this one. A couple of things you know, which uh, I, I think you know, could be a way forward from, uh, from this uh, uh, in, interesting you know, conversation that we just had was uh, that digital skills are now, uh, they have become indispensable of, uh, to advance uh, uh, communities, and if you see, you know, all the questions that uh, the Bangladesh, you know, uh, women's uh, uh, IGF uh, have po 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 uh, had posed, uh, they all talk about, you know, how can we utilize, you know, digital skills uh, to to advance uh, of some of these, you know, disadvantaged uh, communities. So this is this is one thing, you know, which has become an extremely, you know, like important from uh, from this one. So the other thing is that uh, we. Uh, really have to care for this 15% of the global population, which somehow are being, you know, left out from the digital dialogue, you know, let's put it, you know, let not even, you know, take it into consideration of, you know, like uh, digital engagement, even from digital dialogue, they have been left out. So I think, you know, we'll have to find um, special, say, provision, special, you know, policy and a and lot of things uh, for for them. The third point, you know, that I would like to uh, say is that internet has now become um, not only an, uh, uh, an conduit to provide services, but at the same time, you know, it has also bring in a lot of, you know, goods and services to the people. So this did, so digital divide, you know, can not only uh, say, um, keep them um, like, you know, uh, like in the dark, you know, from uh, from the inf information uh, like explosion that is taking place you know, around us, but also you know, devoid them of uh, of, uh, of services and goods, you know, that uh, the governments are providing. So that is extremely important. Some uh, one of our colleagues, you know, essentially, you know, talked about you know Rome uh, principles. So this is something you know that UNESCO has has, uh, has said. So internet, you know, essentially should be right based. You know, it should be open. It should be access to everyone and all also, you know, guided by um, uh, multi-stakeholder processes. So I think, you know, that is a very st uh, a strong, you know, message that UNESCO has provided. So perhaps, you know, like we should uh, somehow think about utilizing the Rome uh, framework and come up with, you know, uh, uh, indicator that will actually measure the level of divide, you know, that exists around the world. Thank you so much, Chair. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we are absolutely on time to end it. I will take my two minutes to close it. Uh, just to summarize, uh, what we discussed mainly is that, if I can divide that into two parts, one, one issue on digital divide is the typical physical digital divide, which is like people connected, people not connected. And then the other part is that division within the, those who are connected, you know, how deep that connect divide is. And that is based on various levels, that is based on language, content, quality of access, internet shutdown, control of internet. Also, if not control, there is a market uh, level overpowering, uh, you know, uh, influence on uh, like how platform is, has become internet, almost like internet. So internet is just about using four or five platform and searching on the Google and that's about it. Um, and, and then you are of course searching those content which is available on that and 75% of that has no language diversity. Uh, and if it is not language diversity, it is also no culture 
cultural diversity. It, if it is not cultural diversity, you don't have a depth of the content also. You're not listening or seeing. And I, if, if I look within, within IGF, and I made a tweet yesterday saying that there is not a single uh, a person who is not connected is here. I mean, if we are talking about IGF, we are not even inclusive ourselves. This platform itself is not inclusive. We haven't made an effort to bring those who are unconnected to listen to them. Uh, or we haven't brought those who are suffering from connectivity also, maybe internet shutdown like in, in India, there is a region which is in under, uh, internet shutdown, which is Manipur. I'm sure at any point of time, they are not here. So uh, we also do not make those efforts. So digital divide is a very deep issue. Uh, it's a very, uh, I would say it's a very emotional issue also. And I would, in my conclusion, I would also reply to the Bangladesh intervention. Uh, and, and a way forward, if I can make, is that the only way digital divide uh, can be overcome is to look at internet or digital from gender perspective. perspective. It's something like if your house is not complete without gender inclusion, how can you be, your, your colony can be complete and therefore how can we internet be complete without them? And if you start looking at internet and digital from gender perspective, you immediately become inclusive, you immediately become them as a, as a, as a, as a, as a front runner of the internet and therefore you have more inclusion, you have more content inclusion also, you have more diversity inclusion also. Uh, and this is my personal experience working in India is that when we go to work in villages we first give the connectivity devices or, uh, or, or access to women first. And whenever we give to women, it is utilized better, it is saner, it is peaceful, it is also good business and also the business outcome goes to the family, you know, rather than goes somewhere else. Uh, seriously, and, and we have seen that one. And, and I would say the women are the best proof that if you want meaningful connectivity, give the connectivity to women. <laughs> it, there will always be meaning. That's what we have seen in the, in the, at least in India. And I would like to uh, end there by saying that uh, the way forward is that all of us sitting here on the panel uh, are responsible for fighting digital divide and also taking the access, as Zina said, taking the access to those people who are not connected uh, with the skills and uh, honor. Thank you very much for everybody's uh, participation and patience. Thank you, dear uh, panel and my uh, co-moderator, uh, Julian, which has silently been managing the online. <laughs> yes, I, I, I just want to say thank you to the uh, government of Japan to uh, host this uh, meeting and also to the NRIs that has been participating in organizing the collaborative sessions. Uh, it's an effort uh, behind this and um, I, I wanted to highlight that that uh, it's important to continue working together, uh, addressing these issues as well as all the technical staff that uh, everything works uh, smoothly because uh, they are also supporting us in uh, bringing this session to the remote hubs like in Bangladesh and the people online. Great, thank you, Julian. We will end with those, those note of thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>